Howdy again everyone, and today I'm testing out a new Voigtlander lens, which is currently only for Fuji's X-mount camera system, the 35mm f0.9. That's an exciting maximum aperture, about 25% brighter than f1, which is plenty bright enough as it is. That makes the lens very useful for getting images with striking out of focus backgrounds and for shooting in the dark obviously, and also 35mm on an APS-C camera is a lovely standard field of view, about 53mm, so that's very useful for all kinds of photography work. The lens is manual focus and manual aperture, although it does have electronic connections for communicating EXIF information back to the camera. This is the second brightest lens I've ever tested. The brightest was that awful Handavision 40mm f0.85. In its favour, the Handavision lens is a little less expensive than the Voigtlander, which costs an eye-watering US dollars or about £1,200 here in the UK. Well, at least the Voigtlander is less than half the size and half the weight, and also can't possibly have image quality any worse than the Handavision. I'd like to thank Voigtlander's UK distributor for loaning me this new lens for a couple of weeks for testing, although as usual, this is a totally independent review. Voigtlander's more expensive lenses are well known for being some of the best manual focus optics in the world, and certainly when it comes to build quality, this thing is beautiful to handle, and considering its incredibly bright aperture, it's not really all that big. At about 500 grams, or just over a pound, the lens has a little weight to it though, and one disappointment is that it doesn't appear to be weather sealed. The lens's focus ring turns extremely smoothly, and with quite a lot of precision, I didn't really have any problems manually focusing this thing, even at f0.9. Then again, I suppose I've had a bit more practice than most people at this point of manually focusing lenses. As you can see here, the lens does suffer from moderately heavy focus breathing, zooming in and out as you change focus. Then comes that aperture ring, it turns with lovely clicks at every third of an f-stop, and the aperture mechanism features 12 iris blades. As I mentioned before, this lens does not feature autofocus, and neither does it feature image stabilisation, although it communicated with the in-body stabilisation of my Fuji X-T5 camera perfectly. Its front filter size is 62mm wide, and it comes with a rather narrow, but nicely machined and flocked metallic lens hood. Overall, the lens has gorgeous build quality, and thankfully that focus ring is precise enough for manually focusing at f0.9. So, let's move on and check out its image quality. I'll be greatly challenging this lens by testing it on one of the most demanding sensors ever made, on a Fuji X-T5, a 40 megapixel APS-C sensor. At f0.9, we see good sharpness in the middle, average contrast levels, but a whole ton of purple fringing on contrasting edges, unfortunately. For portrait or black and white photography, this won't be a problem. Well, not a huge problem anyway, but for anything else, contrasting edges will get a bit ugly. Let's look over into the corners. We are seeing an image with a level of detail here, but it's rather clouded over by low contrast. Let's stop down to f1, you don't often hear me saying that in these reviews do you? The corners look about the same. In the middle of the image though, we're seeing a little more contrast than before. Stop down to f1.4 for a very nice improvement in sharpness and contrast here, and at f2, picture quality in the middle is now perfect. No mean feat for a lens on a 40 megapixel camera. Corner image quality has now become sharper and punchier, although obviously it still lags behind the middle, and we are also seeing a little colour fringing here. Stopping down to f2.8 or f4 brings more improvement, leaving us with very good image quality in the corners, although still not quite as sharp as in the middle. The lens stays this sharp down to f8, although f11 and f16 get really quite soft due to the effect of diffraction on such a very high resolution camera. Ok then, well, considering that we're testing on such a demanding camera, this is generally a good performance for such an extreme design of a lens. The lens offers a decent level of sharpness, which only gets better as you stop down. The most disturbing issue though is obviously that purple fringing at f0.9. But remember, that's only on contrasting edges, away from the test chart in real world use, it's not as noticeable as you can see here. 
Alright, let's get around any in-camera corrections by shooting in RAW, and take a look at distortion and vignetting. The lens projects a small amount of barrel distortion here, but at f0.9 the image corners are really quite dark, unsurprisingly. At f1.4, f2 and f2.8 they brighten up really well, but that's about as bright as they get, so just an average performance here. This lens can focus as closely as 35 centimeters from your subject, which is a really nice little feature. And the further good news is that Voigtlander have done at least some work in optimizing this lens for close shooting, as even at f0.9 it's just a sharp in the middle, although contrast is still low and purple fringing strong. At f1.4 and f2 though, image quality quickly gets far better. Let's see how the lens works against bright lights now. At f0.9, perhaps unsurprisingly, there's some pretty broad flaring to be seen here. Thankfully, it only really appears when bright lights are directly in the image frame. Stopping down to f1.4 or f2 gets things under control quite quickly. And while we're working in the dark, let's take a look at coma and sun stars. At f0.9, perhaps unsurprisingly, we see rather strong coma smearing on bright points of light in the edges of the picture. At f1.4 it's greatly reduced, and at f2, pretty much gone. Let's reposition the camera and look for sun stars now. At f0.9 and f1, there's really nothing here. However, straight from f1.4, noticeable sun stars are already emerging. From f2 all the way down to f11, they get even bigger and brighter. However, on my copy of the lens at f16 and f22, they become a little ill-defined. Still, those nice sun stars make up for the coma smearing a bit, I think. Next, bokeh. I really liked the quality of this lens's bokeh, it's beautiful and soft, and at f0.9, there's plenty of it to be seen. However, in transitional zones or other difficult areas, it can get a little busy looking. And finally, related to bokeh comes longitudinal chromatic aberration, which is very strong on this one, as you can see at f0.9, it's still looking pretty bad at f1.4 and f2, at f2.8 it begins to clear up though, and at f4 it's virtually gone. That is a bit disappointing, but I'm glad it doesn't seem to affect the overall bokeh characteristic of the lens's image. On the whole, then, this is a lens of some idiosyncrasy. It's certainly quite sharp, considering the demanding camera I was testing it on, but it also certainly has issues with colour fringing, which kind of spoil the party, and some coma and some flaring at f0.9. But at the end of the day, the kind of images it can get are addictively beautiful, and it's lovely to handle if you happen to enjoy manually focusing, so to people who appreciate those things, I can recommend this very nice lens. If you can take into account its limitations, then it is really fun to shoot at f0.9. It is definitely a bit overpriced though, I hate to say it, especially for a manual focus option, so think about this thing carefully before you go and see your bank manager. Alright, thanks for watching everyone, I love covering the more extreme lenses that are out there, particularly those with a crazy bright aperture. I'd like to say a special thank you to all my supporters over on Patreon, check it out in the description below. Patreon supporters get all kinds of exclusive bonus content, and they make a big difference to me keeping this channel trucking on. Ciao for now everyone.